<laughs> well, welcome everybody to tonight's to library. And, uh, glad you're here. Okay, uh, tonight um, uh, we have uh, Tracy Allison who will be talking about her book Dying and Living in the Arms of Love and, the, and her pilgrimage to, pilgrimage to Tibet. Um, she did a quite amazing thing, as you probably know if you've you read the press. She uh, uh, prostrated around a mountain in Tibet, Mount Kailash, and it took her uh, 28 days and 34 miles. And this is going to be the topic of her talk tonight. And uh, and the people she met, and uh, I guess this spiritual journey that she uh, that she uh, uh, went through. And it's uh, it just seems like such an amazing thing to do. And um, I believe she's probably the first Westerner to ever, uh, you know, prostrate herself around uh, Mount Kailash. So you're looking at a uh, the first person to do that. Here. So uh, um, please welcome uh, Tracy Allen. <laughs> Thanks for being here on this rainy, beautiful night. <laughs> In 2005, I received a spiritual calling to go to Tibet and to do prostrations around Mount Kailash. In 2006, I did that, and the book I wrote and this talk tonight is about my experiences. Hello, viewers. So good to see you. Uh, about my experiences in going around this sacred mountain. This is a shot of the south face of Mount Kailash. It's uh, one of three sacred mountains in Tibet. It's arguably the most sacred mountain in the world. It's often spoken of as the center of the spiritual universe. It's um, sacred to four religions. The Bonpos are the original shamanistic religion in Tibet. The Buddhists, the Hindus, and the Jains all hold Kailash to be sacred, and their gods live atop it. It's 22,022 feet in elevation. Um, out of respect for its sacredness, it's never been climbed. One expeditioner almost climbed it once, but at the last moment desisted out of respect. This is still the south face, and this is um, Chu Gampa. Gampa is a monastery, which is one of the monasteries around Lake Manasarabar. Um, Kailash is also in the western plateau, the high plateau in the wilderness of, of Tibet. So it's at high elevations. So the lowest you're at is 14,500 feet. And it goes around the path circumambulating the mountain to a height of 18,600, 500, 600 feet at Dromala Pass. I, I was completely naive um, when I accepted this spiritual calling to go to Tibet. I, I thought, I've been on the Continental Divide, I've been in the Rocky Mountains, running around, didn't bother me, altitude will be fine. Um, I had no concept. Um, one of my clients, though, did tell me that people die of altitude sickness. I thought, good to know. Good to know. So, um, anyway. Uh, circumambulating Kailash is called doing the Korra. The Korra path around Kailash is 34 miles in length. Um, most people walk that in three days. It's 34 miles. People walk 10, 12 miles a day and get around the mountain in about three days. Um, a very small number of people do prostrations around the mountain. And as Jerry said, unbeknownst to me, no Westerner had done that, um, which I, I find actually very humorous. Uh, I, I don't even go camping. <laughs> you know, I'm just not an outdoors kind of person. Um, but anyway, <laughs> apparently some Japanese have, have prostrated the Korra uh, around Kailash. And of course Tibetans do, it's one of their very sacred rituals. Um, it takes Tibetans about 17 days to prostrate around the mountain, it took me 28 days, which is pretty great. Um, I don't know how many of you know what prostration is, or what a walking prostration is, but let me show you. I, I, I didn't know either. Uh, my friend and teacher, Marcus Daniels, um, when I said, Marcus, I'm going to Tibet, I'm going to do prostrations, he said, do you know how to do a walking prostration? I said, no, and he showed me. <laughs> so it goes like this. 
You just raise your hands, it's body, speech, and mind, sacred centers. Come all the way down to the earth, stretch out completely, reach your hands out. Go back to kneel. Then you walk to where your fingertips were and do it again. And you're saying a mantra all the time. So basically, one body length at a time, you move around the mountain. Um, what was the mantra that you said? I said a Tibetan mantra. Dijun Jang Jung Nipo Mato Bar, Lama Kunchuk Sula Tatsuchi, Dani Junte Korwa Mato Bar, Kumagi Sanjan Kungi Fande Dro. And I repeated that. At, at times I did other prayers, kind of whatever came into my mind. But I'd say 90% of the time I did that. And what that is in English is the refuge mantra. So going down to the ground, you take refuge in all true sources of refuge. And arising is the bodhicitta mantra, where you're committed to the well-being and the, the liberation of all sentient beings for as long as time abides. So it's refuge going down and bodhicitta coming up. So that's prostrations. And I mean, I really can't describe how amazing it is to have your body be part of a prayer. But that's really, it's, you know, I, I said in my book that I, I had a longing to go to Tibet to kiss the earth with my body. And the walking prostrations incorporate, obviously incorporate your body as part of the prayer. This is a shot of the north base of Kailash. Um, when I received the calling, I realized I needed to take a space out of my life. For whatever reasons, I work a lot. And I had never taken more than two weeks off in my life for anything, I don't think. And I decided I needed to take three weeks, three, three months off of my life. I would spend seven or eight of those in Tibet and a couple weeks on each end preparing and returning. Uh, some of you know I work as a psychologist in my own uh, office in the Keene area. And so as the time grew close, I told the folks I worked with I'd be leaving for three months. <coughs> got folks settled that they needed coverage or backup or anything like that. But I made no appointments for when I came back. Um, I told people if they wanted to call me, I'd be back in October. They were certainly free to call me, but I, I put nothing in my appointment book. I didn't know if I was coming back. I didn't know who I would be, um, Judy, <laughs> when I came back. Um, and it was kind of amazing to just close up my life and walk away with nothing waiting for me. But I did that. And you know, being a non-hiker, a non-camper, and a non-outdoors person, I thought I should get in shape. So one night I went to Sears and Roebuck when that still existed, and I got an ellipsis machine, and I hauled it home, and I put it together, which was a marathon in and of itself. And I hopped on it, and I, I pedaled for like 30 seconds, <laughs> thought I would die. <laughs> I worked up to two minutes. I remember working up to two minutes, and that was good. I was very proud of myself. And I kept going until I could, you know, pedal on the ellipsis machine for 45 minutes to an hour uh, every day, uh, just trying to build up endurance. Um, I began doing prostrations um, until I could do <coughs> several hours. I remember the first day I did five hours of prostrations. I just sat and I stared at a wall for about two or three hours because I couldn't think. It wasn't just that I was physically tired, I was just consumed. My, my brain was just done. Everything was done. But I kept doing prostrations and walking prostrations until I could do... Hi, Ron. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Come on in. I just kept working at it until I could do eight or nine hours of prostrations a couple of days in a row and still function. Um, and then I would, I would add um, my boots, start prostrating in my hiking boots, which adds weight. You know, uh, my friend Marcus said, you know, you don't want to carry a backpack. I'm thinking, what's a little fanny pack? You know, what's a little day pack? Anything that weighs anything when you're at high altitudes is too much. It's just too much. Some of you probably knew Ed Hutchins, the leather worker in Keene. He died a couple years ago. He was a dear friend of mine. And he, I told him I needed 
a heavy leather apron to protect my body from the ground. And he gave me this magnificent letter and made me this apron. which is what I wore on Cora. It still has the dirt of Tibet on it. I've never cleaned it, and nor will I ever. Um, it weighs four pounds, which I also had to get used to prostrating with that because any weight is huge. And he helped me get linings for the hand clogs. So I had two sets of hand clogs. So that when I came down on the ground, my body and my hands were uh, protected from the earth. And one of my dear friends gave me a little statue of Ganesh. I'm sure many of you know Ganesh is the remover of obstacles and the teacher of joy. If you don't know how to play or have fun, Ganesh is your guy. <laughs> and Ganesh was never far from me. There were many obstacles. And, um, he's just he's a great traveling companion. Um, so, I left for Tibet in late July 2006. In late May 2006, about two months before I left, I was having a kind of a visionary dream. It was like a nightmare, but it was not your ordinary run of the mill nightmare. And in the middle of that nightmare, I sat bolt upright in bed. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, the pitch black, raging. I was raging at divinity. I was furious. And I said, why did you call me? And my language was actually more colorful than that. <laughs> I feel like I received a call. And I'm packed and dressed. And I've got all my stuff together. And I've got special gear. And I've been busily preparing. And now I walk through a door. And I'm in a huge space like an airplane hangar, and it's empty, huge and empty. And I'm standing here, a speck in a huge, empty void, standing here wondering, why the fuck did you call me? What am I doing here? I can't do this, is all around the edges of my consciousness. Despair is all around the edges of my consciousness. It took me two days to calm down and just keep preparing. Two months later, the day before I left for Tibet, I wrote, I think of leaving for Tibet tomorrow. I feel like a newborn baby. I feel like I've never done one prostration and that I don't even know how. I feel naked and tender and nervous and open. I feel in the hands of Tibet, willing. I feel the mountain welcoming me to the feast of my life. My life is the feast. I will be devoured, piece by piece, while the hands of Tibet hold me gently. I feel that I'm stepping into a sacred consciousness that is so far beyond anything I have touched, and that it is home, and it is welcoming me back. That was one of my learnings because clearly something happened between being outraged that divinity would set me up and drop me off in the void with no map and no directions and no explanation and no accompaniment. And the peacefulness that all I had, all I had was showing up. There's no mastery. You just show up. And that's one of the learnings that I had, is that a pilgrimage is like, like a series of concentric circles. It, a pilgrimage isn't one thing. So clearly, even in the preparations, getting ready before I, to, before I even left for Tibet, I had completed a pilgrimage already. When I received the calling to go, it took me a few months to answer. Because you don't answer these things lightly, because once you answer it, it's done. It's done, it's not reversible. So there's a pilgrimage in making the decision and a pilgrimage in the preparation. There are many, many pilgrimages within the pilgrimage to Kailash. 
Anagarika Govinda is one of the really beautiful, lucid writers on Tibetan Buddhism. Of his pilgrimage to Kailash, he said, nobody can approach the throne of the gods, Kailash, or penetrate the mandala of Shiva or Demchag, Kailash, or whatever name he likes to give to the mystery of ultimate reality without risking his life and perhaps even the sanity of his mind. He who performs the parikrama, the kora, the ritual circumambulation of the holy mountain, with a perfectly devoted and concentrated mind, goes through a full cycle of life and death. When I got home, I wrote, circumambulating Kailash is a cycle of death and life. It does destroy your mind and change your body. It does take away the illusion of knowledge and mastery. And it's the blessing of Shiva, which is the Hindu god atop Kailash, or Demchad, the Buddhist god. Their blessing is to strip away the illusion that you know anything or can do anything. As Govinda states, the fear of death loses its power because one learns through the mercy of Tara, the saviors, that mercy is stronger than karma. You know, Govinda's comment, I mean, karma, we do harm just by living. You know, when we miss opportunities, we kill other beings, we screw things up, we <laughs> choose our dark side. We, the karma is accruing constantly, but it, it, it is nothing when it's held in the mercy, which dissolves in all. So, I left. I flew through Delhi, India. You'll recognize this, those who've been to Nepal. Through, flew through Delhi, India, um, out of Newark, New Jersey, um, and into Kathmandu, Nepal. And my friend and teacher, Marcus Daniels, uh, knew, he had been to Kailash, and he knew a Rinpoche, a high Buddhist teacher, in. Uh, the Kathmandu area gave me his name and number. So before I left uh, Kathmandu for Tibet, I visited the Bodna Stupa, which is one of the famous Buddhist sites, and then went to see Rangri Rinpoche. This is Rangri Rinpoche. He's a Buddhist teacher. His wife made me the most delicious Tibetan dinner. And Michael Sangpo, who lives in America, but his family lives in Nepal, joined us to uh, translate. And Rinpoche was very kind and gave me advice on the Korah, gave me instructions on the Korah, and gave me his blessing. Um, I, I asked three Rinpoches for their blessings um, that, that I studied with before I left, uh, which is also, if you've ever received a Buddhist blessing, it's an amazing experience. You, you feel it into your body. It's a very physical experience. Um, my travel agent set up a four-man crew. So there was me, I was a group of one. And then I had a driver and a guide and a Sherpa and a cook. Um, so they were to accompany me to Kailash and two of them would come around the mountain with me. So here we are driving out of Kathmandu, out of Nepal, which is very tropical. Here's all the terracing for the rice paddies. And we're driving north toward the border. And here we're across the border, entering into Tibet. And you, you can see, just by the terrain, we're not in the tropics anymore. Um, you know, um, actually, um, we, we had probably were not even a mile outside Zhangmu, which is the border town, um, where I met my Tibetan guide, my Tibetan driver, and my Nepalese Sherpa, Sherpa and Cook came across the border. They were actually Tibetans living in Nepal. And we all piled into the land cruiser and we headed to Kailash because you have to drive five days across the land to get to Kailash. There's no easy way to get there. And you know, part of the Chinese genocide is to put an airport into Kailash to flood it with tourists and another culture because that's a really easy way to destroy a culture is to flood it with a competing culture. But when I went, and I think still, if you want to get to Kailash, you have to really want to get there because it takes you five days of driving if you go through Xiangmu. Um, I'm not well read in Buddhism, um, but I had read about Padmasambhava or Guru Rinpoche, who was the scholar and saint who brought Buddhism to Tibet in the 8th century. It said that, that 
his foot touched almost all of the land of Tibet as he came into Tibet and tamed the shamanistic spirits, you know, the Nagas, the elemental energies, the gods, and he tamed them in the service of Buddhism. When we crossed the border from Nepal into Tibet and began driving, which is up, everything in Tibet is up. It's the rooftop of the world and you're always climbing, you're just never not climbing. And we're driving out of the town and into the countryside and the power of that land. I was sitting in the front seat. My guides were young, in their 20s, and I was, I was 56 when I did this. And I'm sitting in the front seat of this car with these people that I don't know, and they don't know me. The tears are streaming down my face because I can feel the land. And suddenly I understood what Guru Rinpoche had done. So you can feel the Nagas contained in the land, the shamanistic elemental spirits contained in the land. The power in the land is stunning. And so part of me is having that experience, and part of me is thinking my crew probably thinks they have a crazy middle-aged woman that is now <laughs> crying in their front seat, and they don't know why. Um, but it just moved me so deeply. So we began our five-day journey. Um, as we drove across the land, and it, usually it was the land, sometimes there were roads, but often we were just driving across the land, we would stop at tea houses for lunch. And my uh, crew would have a big bowl of dried yak meat and a big bowl of sampa, which is barley, uh, ground barley and uh, Tibetan salt tea. I would have a small piece of cheese and a um, hard-boiled egg, because I was really trying really hard not to throw up. Um, and that was preoccupation. These are the innkeepers of that particular tea house. And this is my crew. This is Jigme, who's probably 40 or late 30s. He was my driver. This is Dorje, who was 28. Um, an amazing young man. He was a monk. He was imprisoned by the Chinese for two and a half years. And when they let him out of prison, they would not let him return to his monastery, which feels to me unbelievably cruel. So he asked the Dalai Lama for permission to work as a guide and then worked as a guide. I mean, how fortunate was I to have him as my guide, <laughs> since I'm not a Buddhist, and I don't really understand these things. So there's Dorje. This is Nima, who is my cook, who's 22, and Rick Jin, who is my Sherpa, uh, and also 22. Nima and Rick Jin came around the mountain with me. I, mean, I loved the stenciling and the colorfulness of the, the uh, Tibetan culture. This is from the second day of driving. It's 3.19 in the morning, we stopped at a guest house, and I'm awake, and I wrote, death is an experience, not a concept. As I approach Mount Kailash, I can feel myself dying. It's very slow and pronounced, so I can be available for the experience. I choose to be available. This is a hard journey. Everything about it is hard. The time changes, the flight schedules, the heat in India and Nepal and the cold in Tibet, the horrendous roads. It's not a matter of just driving somewhere. Getting somewhere is an achievement and it has a cost. I am willing, but there are no free minutes. Everything is chosen or resisted and that is that. Bathing is difficult, bathrooms are difficult, and eating is difficult. I happen to look up at my headboard in this guest house, someone painted and stenciled it beautifully, every inch of it. There's beauty everywhere. I am not coming to sights, I'm coming to me. There's a strength so much deeper than the strength from working out at a gym. Now I need to rest. That was 3.19 in the morning. At 5.30, I wrote, my plan was to get up and take a sponge bath. My body's plan was to throw up, which I promptly did when I got up. Um, so I began my first bout of altitude sickness, which um, the next day, we drove for eight hours each day across fields, through rivers, occasionally on roads. And I spent the whole eight hours hanging out the window of a Land Cruiser throwing up. I mean, not constantly, but throughout the day for eight hours I was throwing up. And Dorje was very sweet. He tapped me on the shoulder, this is Dorje, and he said, you know, Jigme, my driver, would he'll, he'll stop if you just let him know, and then you can pull over, you can hop out of the car and throw up more comfortably. But there was never enough warning. You know, you're not really sick when you have altitude sickness, you're just throwing up. It's, you 
can't mm -hmm. keep anything down. Um, so that began. Jigme was amazing. Um, I, I remember we were driving across this enormous plane, <coughs> which is driving and driving and driving, and then in the middle of the plane he turned left. <laughs> <laughs> and then about 20 minutes later we came on a road. And I'm thinking, how do you know how to turn left in a field? But it, that, that was, that's the wilderness. As you approach Kailash, which is up here, the first thing you come to are two sacred lakes, Lake Rakshas Tal and Lake Manasarabar. Rakshas Tal is the lake of power, and shamans come here to complete their training, and Manasarabar is the lake of wisdom and Buddhists come there to complete their training. Um, and that's, I had a little Instamatic camera, so I could only take picture of pieces of the lake. This is the road which ends in Lake Manasarabar. We camped there for two nights just to acclimate. I wrote, we arrive at Lake Manasarabar. I can see the base of Mount Kailash through the clouds. It's very hard to see. Kind of tucked in there, but there are some other clearer pictures of it. I can see the base of Mount Kailash, but the rest is shrouded in clouds. My guide tells me that if I want to do prostrations, they start here, toward Kailash. I am as awkward as any complete novice, but I get down on the ground and begin prostrations. Everything in my body hurts. For whatever reason, after five days in a car, over savage roads, in an experience that can only be described as a bread-kneading machine. Suddenly, this afternoon, my mid-back hurts so much I can hardly sit. I do squats and stretches, but my body feels fragile. Prostrating in the dirt road leading toward Manasarabar hurts everything on my front and everything on my back. But I began. Um, I had turned away from the lake, and when I turned back, there was this lovely um, rainbow greeting me, which I took as a, a spiritual welcoming sign. Mafam Lhotso is the Tibetan words for Matasarava. This is Chugampa, which we saw earlier. It's built into the side of the mountain. Matasarava is you know, over here. Uh, and since Dorje had been a monk, he knew many of the monks and monasteries and, and took me there. I about died climbing up there, because um, we're at 14,000 feet at least by now. And climbing up there, I thought, man, this is going to be some, some journey. Um, this is one of the shrine rooms. It's a very poor monastery. The Chinese have allowed four monks to come back to care for the sacred objects in the monastery. I don't know how what the original census was, but it was a full-size monastery. And so there were four there. Um, and these are butter lamps which um, are lighted in prayer. These are two of the monks when I was uh, seeing Ron Rinpoche. He asked if I could bring um, letters and prayer books to his brother and to some monks in Tibet. I mean, Tibet's an occupied state, so you can't just mail something to someone. Um, even when I call my friend Dorje there, I never say anything important because all the phone calls are monitored, which is weird. It's very weird that you can endanger somebody by asking the wrong question. Um, but they were they were thrilled. This was Pema. I don't remember his name, but I mean, the holiness of these lamas was just incredible to me. This is another shot of Manasarabar. There's a clearer shot of Kailash. And again, the lake would be in the foreground. Um, these are the Indian guest houses because Manasarabar and Kailash are sacred to the Hindus, and they, are, they have guest houses where they. Either, um, where they come to Manasarabar and to Kailash. Um, my camera couldn't really capture this. There's rain moving in over the lake. But there was still this band of azure blue just shining through from Lake Manasarabar. Uh, I walked around part of the lake before we left, and this is a little meditation cave where you can climb up and do practice if you wish. And then this is Dorje teaching me the etiquette of hanging prayer flags before we left. I brought many prayer flags, blessed by my friends and teacher that I wanted to leave, praying in the winds of Tibet for all of us. And then we headed to Kailash. Um, so here's Kailash, and this is the circuit around it, the Korra Path, 34 miles. 
Um, and this is Darchin, which is the only town, because we're in wilderness, no one lives here. The only people here are pilgrims. So Darchin is the town where you can rent yaks and horses and supplies for your journey. Tarbashe is where there's a huge flagpole with prayer flags streaming down from it. It's where the Tibetans come each year to celebrate their major religious festivals. And between Darchin and Tarbashe is about, I'd say, two kilometers. It's the only place you can drive. Um, once you pass Tarbashe, you're either on foot or you're on horseback. Um, no cars until you get around the mountain and come back around to Darchin. Um, the wilderness has no markers. I never knew where I was, which is kind of an amazing experience. There was no way to track what was happening. There are three gompas or monasteries. Chupu Gampa is right at Tarbashe, and you can see it as you begin Kora if you start from Tarbashe. Drirapuk Gampa is kind of at the top of the western stretch of the Kora. This is Dromala Pass, which is the 18,500 or 600 foot pass, the highest point on the Kora. And then there's a third monastery, Zutral Puk Gampa, here. And you come back down to Darjan. Those are the only landmarks on the Kora. Um, this is us approaching Darchin. Um, actually, specifically, this is us right here. It's the hood of the car. Mm -hmm. And of all the rivers we, we drove through, which was a lot, it's the only one we got stuck in. <laughs> the problem with rivers is that you can't see the bottom of the river because it's a river. Um, and we drove in. And the funny thing is, you know the, the stereotype of Japanese people who take thousands of pictures of everything? It's really true. <laughs> because there was, there was a bus and a land cruiser across the river, and when they saw us get stuck, they all leaped out <laughs> and began taking tons and tons of It was the funniest thing. Um, fortunately, there were, this is out my window, just looking at the river go by. There was two land cruisers that came behind us, and one had a winch and pulled us out. The etiquette seems to be when you're stuck, you're stuck. You know, I, I've driven around a lot of Tibet, because I went back the following year again. Um, and Vehicles break down and nobody stops. Um, but fortunately, one had a winch and pulled us out. And we got to Darchin. Um, this is a guest house. Uh, some guest houses are not this pretty on the outside. I think the Chinese are trying to make it appealing to tourists. Um, but guest houses are very basic. They're basically cinder block buildings. So there's no heat. There's no running water. Um, this had electricity one hour at night, from 10 to 11. I knew that because when I got into my room, I discovered the bed looked very nice, but it actually was a, a piece of plywood, like three quarter inch plywood, with a very thin cloth mattress on it, which was fine. Um, and there was like a little night table next to it with like 12 light switches on it. I thought, where do all these light switches go? So I put them all on, nothing happened. So I went to sleep, and then about an hour later, the lights came on, because <laughs> you had electricity for about an hour. Um, they didn't all work, but some, some worked. The bathrooms were about 150, 200 yards behind this building. Um, and there, I walked down there to, to check out the facilities, and there were two flush toilets and two squat toilets. And the flush toilets were, one was brimming with brown water, and the other was totally empty, but covered in fecal matter, which made the squat toilets look really good. <laughs> they had sinks along the wall, and I turned the sinks on to wash my hands, and water went everywhere except on my hands. So the infrastructure is just not there. They make it look pretty, but there's really no infrastructure um, in, the, in the country at this point. When I came back around to Darchin, after by then probably 25 days prostrating out of the wilderness, and I went down to that bathroom, I thought, facilities. <laughs> I'd gotten humbler, I'd gotten more appreciative, even though I liked toileting in the out of doors, but still, it was, it was an effort. My guides, uh, we were supposed to have yaks and horses, we had rented, we had reserved at Darchin, but they had been given away to another party. So that meant my guides had to carry everything. That, that meant a propane tank for cooking, as well as duffel bag, tents, cooking, foods, everything. So they decided we would start at Tarbashe, and here's the famous enormous flagpole at Tarbashe. And I would go around the mountain from Tarbashe back around through, through Darshan and back to Tarbashe. So that would be my starting point.
And so we started. Um, we decided we would start early and be in the Land Cruiser at 9 in the morning on the first day. I was nervous, and when I don't know what I'm doing, I like to just get on with it and have the experience. So we decided to start early. So two of my crew were there at 9, and I was there. And the other two, um, Nima and Richard specifically, were nowhere to be found. So for an hour and a half, we waited. Then they just popped into the car like <coughs> nothing happened, and we left. I thought, is this the culture? You know, do they just do time differently than Westerners do time? What they had done was to go and get cokes, cans of coke and incense to celebrate the beginning of my core, mm -hmm. which, which touched me deeply, because they didn't know who I was. I was just this white, middle-aged Western woman who wasn't a Buddhist. And still, they celebrated. Dorje gave me a kata which is a white silk scarf, is how Tibetans greet you and bless you. Um, and you know, after this was over, I went to several cities in central Tibet with my crew, and Dorje and I were just walking around one of the cities one day, and he said, you know, for the first two weeks, I didn't think you could do this, mm -hmm. right? So it isn't like they were celebrating because they actually thought I could do this. It was just an act of love. It's just an act of pure kindness with no foundation except their hearts under it. I was very, very moved. And then, and they all dressed me, we all put my apron on, we all put my clogs on, my hand clogs on, and they were very excited to be part of this. Um, and then, this is the first prostration, Dorje said, you know, start at the fireplace, because then you'll know exactly where you began and exactly where to come back to, because you don't want to miss any piece of this. So I began. This is the first prostration. And then, you just head out onto the Cora Trail. I took a lot of pictures of the Cora Trail because it's, it's just impossible to convey how rough it is. It's about 18 inches wide at the most, and it is rocks. Whether you're going through a river delta where the rocks are little round, smooth ones, or on the ground where they're jagged, you are on, on rocks which just penetrate the body as you lie on them. Um, and, and of course, you're going up because you're in Tibet. Sometimes you came down the river, then you go up again. Um, parties of you know, pilgrims walking Kora, or perhaps bringing supplies to the, the monasteries around Kailash would come. I would hear the bells jingling on the horses and on the yaks. And for the first couple of weeks, I would stand up and step to the side. And I knew a horse wouldn't step on me. But I didn't know about yaks. So I would just stand up and, and get off the trail. And when the parties had passed by, I would get back down on the ground and start posturing again. I think the yaks are incredibly beautiful. After about two weeks, I thought I should find out if the yaks will step on you. So I was in the middle of this big plain, just prostrating along, and this enormous herd of yaks, this little young boy yak herd came by. And I just stayed on the Cora path, and the yaks grazed around me, and grazed past me, because they were actually going faster than I was. So don't worry that a yak will step on you. <laughs> In case you ever need to know, you're safe. Um, again, just the beauty of the Tibetan uh, workmanship. Um, these are pilgrims walking the Kora. They have dust masks on because it's so dusty at times. This was our first campsite. This was my little round tent and my crew's tent with a propane tank and a latrine tent, which they put up for this campsite and the second one, and then they never put it up again, yeah. which was fine with me. You know, it, it, Tibetans are very comfortable with their bodies. I mean, it took me a while to figure out why there were no trees to go behind. The first time <laughs> land cruiser stopped for a rest stop, and I turned around and my entire crew was outside relieving themselves, and I thought, I should do this. And I hopped out looking for a tree. <laughs> you're above tree line. You're just so high, you're above tree line, so you just got comfortable with your body. This is a different shot of that. Here's my little tent. So we were at the foot of this enormous waterfall. And this is just normal in Tibet. And the beauty is just astounding to me. Um, this was a, a guy with his yak coming back from the core. He probably went to Dromala Pass and came back down the west side. Since it's wilderness, there are not many people. People stop by to visit and came to see my crew. I said to, to Richin, I said, Richin, you have golden groundhogs. He said, marmot. <laughs> and the marmots are like uh, prairie dogs, and they sing. Ooh. And 
particularly up the west side of Kailash, they just sang. They, they sang me up the mountain. They, this, it was beautiful to listen to them singing. There were fewer on the east side coming back down. This is a party of Korean and Indian people. And my guides told me after they had chatted with them that they were coming back from Dromala Pass, which is the 18,500 foot pass, that they had been unable to go over the pass because of the weather and the altitude, that the exposure was just in the cold, was just too much mm. for them. And my guides told me that the year preceding, 2005, like five people had died on top of Dromala Pass from exposure, wow. and that this year, 2006, seven people had died. Mm -hmm. And I'm ashamed to say, I, I thought, lawsuit. I thought, what happens to <laughs> travel agents who, you know, give you a trip and then your relative dies on top of Domala Pass? So I, I asked, what, what happens when someone dies? And the answer touched me deeply. My guides explained that, you know, Domala Pass is the highest you can get, the closest you can get to the top of Kailash. So if you're on Earth and you want to get to the top of Kailash, Domala Pass is the, is the closest thing to it. So when pilgrims die there, they die in bliss. Mm -hmm. They die as close to their god who lives on top of Kailash. They, they, they die as close to Shiva as they can get, or as close to Denchog as they can get. So they die in bliss. <coughs> I thought that was worth remembering. Mm -hmm. This is the second morning, and I woke up to fresh snow on black rocks, which I found hauntingly beautiful, which is the core path going through there. I wrote, it is hard to begin each day. Each day, this is day two. <laughs> but it was hard, and the night of nightmares didn't make it any easier. For whatever reason, when I'm on retreat or pilgrimage, whatever I haven't dealt with visits me in my dreams. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, really. Also, I, I was realizing that I thought I had lost my camera. And I was still holding on, because I, I study my classmates and I study with Marcus, our teacher, and have for many years, and they're really my family. Um, and so I would be going through this journey, taking pictures, saying, I'm going to go back to class and show them these pictures. I'm going to show this experience and show them these pictures. And then my camera's missing. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And I say, day two, I'm starting to cry again. I'm coming apart. The old supports of familiarity are falling away. It's not the camera. It's the impermanence becoming more real. Everything that orients me, the sense of control, is gone. Each day is just get up and prostrate. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how long. On the trail, I don't know where I am. I don't know if I'll get there. I don't know to what end. I don't know what, what, what will happen if I do this. Dear Lord, the Chinese are out of their minds to mess with this place. Milarepa, Tibet's greatest saint, crosses my mind. The ordeal to break you down, to open you, open you to what you came here for to begin with. I don't want an ordinary life, so what's my problem? Only day two and I'm starting to come apart. I'm grateful, it's what I came for. Even while I'm starting to come apart, there are signs of stabilization. I figured out how to use my Petzl light. <laughs> that I've been reading my novel all afternoon. I'm eating easier, at least tonight. I mean, really, if they had just filmed me in my sleeping bag, it, it would have been worth it, because I couldn't figure out how to use a sleeping bag. But the zipper goes on the top or on the side. But every morning, I'd wake up Velcroed in. All the little tabs would Velcro themselves sometime during the night. Toward the end, I figured out the sleeping bag, too. I got there. Anyway, um, so day two. And heading along the Koro. This is a Kawasaki. Oh my. On a, on, this is the Kora path uh, with a slurry of mud covering it because of the wetness. I was on the Koro 28 days, it rained 24 of them. Oh. Rain, hail. So it was a, a slippery slurry. But if you had money and you had a medical problem, you could hire this Kawasaki to take you back to Darjeeling for medical care. <laughs> You know, most people didn't, so they would just walk back. I mean, what party of like seven people carrying this young woman who was walking as best she could, clearly in a great deal of pain, heading back to Darchin for medical care, because there's nothing around the mountain. There's just wilderness. It's just wilderness. We're in a core trail. It's 
coming through, crossed many river deltas. What did I write? I'm amazed I got five hours of prostrations in. I have no concept of distance. A very nice woman returning from Dromala stopped to talk with me. She said Drirapuk, the next monastery, was great, but when she began climbing to the pass, Dromala, the breathing was too difficult. It seems a lot of people are having trouble with the pass for one reason or another. I can't even see Drirapuk Monastery yet. I was so touched talking with that woman. I would guess she was in her 60s. Her voice was so soft, and so was mine. We just talked about how hard it was to breathe. And she said I was doing so much more. I said I was very blessed and almost couldn't hold back the tears. There was such a kindness about her. People stopped and talked all the time, asked me questions, uh, touched my apron, took my clogs, my hand clogs off, touched me. Um, I didn't speak anything but English. Many people didn't speak English. I mean, the ones who did, it was a blessing you could converse with language. But it's amazing how much you can converse with sign language. I got very adept at talking the sign language. Um, I was very touched by these people. This is all about love. It's all about compassion. It's all about dispelling illusion. It's all about receiving the love that's already here. It's all about breaking down illusionary walls. I could feel today when prostrating that each obstacle, whether it's the weather or crossing a river delta again, is a blessing. It is exactly as it should be. I remain afraid of Droma Law. Every time I thought of Droma Law, I was just fascinated and terrified. Mm -hmm. This was a morning I was very late leaving camp. Nina Law was very late getting up to get my breakfast. So I walked and just took pictures, and by the time I got my camera out of my pocket for this one, this eagle had been you know, circling, circling, circling to Fishing River, and was just about to dive in. Um, all these little white spots over here are sheep. Yeah, I mean, the scale is so enormous. Waterfalls, I just love the waterfalls in Tibet. I think you can see more sheep scattered through here. This is our second campsite, and this is what a tea house looks like from the outside. It's a nomadic tent, um, and on the inside has all that lovely woodwork and stenciling and stoves. Um, and this particular picture I love. The, the shepherds and shepherdesses really touched my heart. They live outdoors with their flocks. So all night long you hear the dogs barking and you know the shepherds are out there with their sheep which come and graze around the tents and stick their noses under the tents and are, are very sweet. Um, but the poignancy of uh, these people are out in the wilderness living with their flocks all the time. And we're, yep, here's another shepherd, and I was just prostrating through his, his pasture lands, and they were just kind of walking alongside, watching me. I like horses, and these horses were nursing and grazing. It was such a crazy day. I felt so ill this morning. I didn't know what I would be able to do. Yet I also felt an opening of the Om Ah Hong. And for a day now that all is light is more and more compelling as a fundamental reality. All is love. It was an odd day of a lot of alone time and a lot of fervent pilgrims. Many Indians seemed so touched by the prostrations I was doing. Two in particular just came unglued. The taller one burst into tears. Both of them insisted on kissing my shoes. They wanted me to touch their heads. They finally went on ahead. I feel they had good hearts and were truly sincere in their pilgrimage. I mean, this happened to me so many times, your people giving me gifts, touching me, wanting me to bless them. I didn't have any blessing to give to them. I was just doing prostrations. E even now, about seven and a half years after this, I'm still understanding what I did. I had no idea what I was doing. These people understood it a lot better than I did and, and kept, kept pulling it out of me, actually. So here we are. We started at Tarbashe, got past the first gompa, we're looking towards seeing Drew for the second gompa. So we're still going up the west side of Kailash. I did not read anything about Kailash or Tibet before I left. Um, I wanted to go and have my own experience. I didn't want to know what I, I didn't want to have preconceptions or think about it through someone else's eyes. When I got back, one of the more detailed guidebooks talks about a place on the Korra Trail 
which is marked by twisted black igneous rock, and that that is there as a reminder of the hell realms, so that if you live your life and don't accrue merit, you could be reborn in a hell realm. It's there to remind you of that. And I thought, I have a picture of that. It's just a stunning, stunning area on the trail. Just twisted black in this rock reminding me. And you can see we're getting higher altitude-wise. There's less and less green. Room. These little birds, uh, fo actually they followed me around. I had just sat down on the side of the corridor trail to rest for a bit, and this Aust Austrian gentleman stopped. He says, you have friends. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the best picture. They didn't like their picture taken, but she stood there and let me take her picture. And every morning, they were outside my tent, wherever we pitched, and we moved camp like nine times as we went on the mountain. When I prostrated far enough past the camp, my guys would move far ahead and pitch camp ahead of me. And every tent site, they were there to say good morning to me. This is one of the cairns. Uh, at the end of the day's prostrations, I would make a cairn so I would know where exactly I stopped and where to return to. And this is one of the prostrations. I have my juice bottle tied to my waist. I'm still wearing knee protectors. The last nine days, I didn't use any knee protectors at all. But I still had those on. My hiking boots and my skirt and my little fleece cap just prostrating on the rugged ground. And you, you, just, you just feel your, your nose to nose with the tops of the mountains. You can imagine the avalanches that happen in the winter. This is the west face of Kailash, which is hauntingly beautiful. This is our, my little round tent. We had to jump a small brook. We couldn't, there was no stepping stones. We had to jump to get across to the campsite in my cruise tent. This. And just to give you the scale, living beings here, very tiny, probably shepherd. One of the rivers, the Tibetan bridges, are like very skinny telephone poles held together with coat hanger wire, uh, laid on uh, you know mounds of rocks. And I tried prostrating across one of them and almost fell in. It's hard to balance on the, the round logs. And so what you do then is you prostrate, the, you count the number of prostrates it would take to get across the river and prostrate on one side or another. Um, this is a shot of a woman who's taking her mount and her husband's mount across through the white water. He's walking across the bridge to join her. Another bridge where a monk is coming across the bridge and then finding again the core path. Continue on. And this is uh, Durapuk Gampa. This was destroyed by the Chinese during the invasion, and they're rebuilding it now and making guest houses, again, to try to encourage tourism. These are all prayer wheels they've put in. Um, I didn't take the time to visit Durapuk because I needed all the time for prostration. I didn't know how long it would take me. And actually, my travel agent allowed me 25 days to get around the mountain. I mean, who knew? Um, and it took me 28. I actually finished the morning of the 29th. And I, I'm thinking, I'm in the middle of the wilderness. Like, who's going to care? I take an extra three days. But it's a totalitarian state, and the Chinese do care if you take an extra three days. And there was a tremendous amount of intrigue as to what bribes we had to pay and to whom we could speak and, and not speak, and make sure certain people did not know we were still there and planning how to stay. It was very educational about living in the Chinese city. Here's another one of our campsites. There's the tent, just to give you a scale, and there's the Korra path, stretching across the land, the pilgrims walking the Korra. I love the sweeping expanse. This is one of the wild Tibetan dogs. There are so many wild dogs. And here's the core trail, of course. And Rinpoche, Ronald Rinpoche, warned me when I was going through the cemeteries um, to be careful of the wild dogs because he said they were, they were getting more hungry and vicious and I should not be alone in the cemeteries. But I was alone all day, so I just did the best I could do. This is one of the cemeteries. Um, Tibetans do sky burial, so they will dismember the body. There's a class within the Tibetan people who dismember. 
the bodies and leave them out for the animals to consume. And um, this is one of the cemeteries. I looked, I looked for body parts as I was prostrating through. Um, did not find any. Uh, but like I mean, you can see, they, some of the rocks are almost dressed as if they are the forms of people. And I checked with my guys, and they said, you know, sometimes they don't put the body parts there, but they will put the clothing there as a prayer for the dead, and sometimes as a prayer for the living. And uh, Jigme, my driver, my verbally non-English speaking driver, actually went and left some of his clothes in one of the cemeteries as a prayer for me, which touched my heart. I wrote, but bodies and clothing aside, the cemetery is so steep, going straight up the hillside that's a small mountain. The path dissolves into boulders and narrow winding turns. The cemetery slash hillside is endlessly high, an amazing incline. I did six hours of prostrations today. It was unbelievable, climbing, climbing, climbing that cemetery. There was cold rain in the air. Sleet storms came on and off throughout the afternoon. I finally made it to the top of the hillside through the cemetery. Once on top, I headed for what looked like a rock gate. I hoped to be able to see Dromala ahead through that, but I didn't find out if I would see it. A thunderstorm and a hailstorm descended, and I kept going thinking I would just stop at that gate. But when the ground was quite white with sleet, I thought it was best to head for home. So tomorrow, I'll find my little cairn and see what is beyond the gate. Probably more valley before I can see anything. I kept throwing up this morning. I can only assume it means we are gaining altitude because I feel fine otherwise. I did get um, altitude sickness a second time, um, because we, 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 you know, gained a good 4,000 feet of elevation just in doing a core around the mountain. I, I'm very naive. I looked at the map and said, okay, if I can just get to Jirapuk, it's a straight shot across to Dormala, and then it's down. <laughs> but this is a 2,400-foot climb in elevation from here to here, which I didn't factor in. So I did get altitude sickness again. Um, today is such an odd mixture of despair and excitement. I can't do this, and such joy is arising for no reason. I tried so hard to get to the starting point of the path to Droma La yesterday, but I couldn't. I just got mired in a boulder field. It was a boulder field that ran through a lake, and I was prostrating on the boulders across the water, which should have worked from a distance, but I couldn't find the path up close. I, couldn't, I could see the path from far away, but not close up. It just goes up. It looks like it goes up a thousand feet, although I don't know. Maybe it's 700, maybe it's more than a thousand, but it is steep. Just up, a line on the hillside in the distance going up. It's not about the psychological lift of starting at the path to Droma La. It's not about a lift or enthusiasm. I can't do this, and I can't do it twice. Make the climb again to Droma La because camp is behind me. So prostrate up, have to walk back to camp, and then walk up and continue prostrating. Just felt like too much. I don't want people around, but they'll come if they come. None of this is on my terms. I'm joyful. I still, I will, I will do practice, eat, and go see what experience comes and what I do with that experience. Such an odd place as I begin my day. So this is, camp is back, back here. And here's a person just for scale. And the path goes straight up here and then swings around to this landing. So I don't, I don't know if you can get that perspective, but I mean, it's hard to catch the perspective, but it, it, it was like about a thousand foot climb to prostrate up, which would have brought me here, and I was hoping I'd be able to see Droma Law from there. Silly me, you know, it's just, you just get up there, and this is, you know, the climb is now behind me, here's that, and, and what, what is next is the next set of hills to keep prostrating up. These are Monty stones. Um, a young man was uh, sitting on the side of the Cora Trail with a chisel and a hammer, and hammering, uh, chiseling sacred syllables and mantras into the stones, making the stones into prayers. On my way back down the path, he invited me for a hot supper. It was very sweet. These people are so poor, but he invited me to eat with him. I, I told him my camp was very close by, so I didn't. But very generous. There was a European climbing party that came by. I was glad because some of them couldn't breathe either. <laughs> now, there was a couple, and the woman was doing fine, but the guy had to sit down every 30 seconds. And when I was walking, I had to sit down every 30 seconds. I could walk about 30 seconds, then I'd have to sit. I just could not breathe. For some reason, I could breathe doing prostrations. I could just continuously prostrate, but I couldn't walk to save my life. 
This is Jean Gaysar. It's one of the, it's a massive rock, which from certain angles looks like a horse. And the mythology is that it's Guru Rinpoche's horse from Tibet. I climbed it up to do side saddle. I'm not so good on heights, so the, the emotional energy would have taken to get my leg over, plus the physical energy. I saved all my energy for frustrations. But the Europeans very kindly took a picture. My camp, my crew is preparing to move camp over Domala Pass. We finally found some horses to help carry the supplies, which I was very glad about. This is another person beginning prostrations. It's not me. <coughs> I feel like we'll never reach Dromala. I kept prostrating. The climb is endless and steep. I could see the pass finally. You can see the prayer flags at the top. I went as far as I could, but I knew it was still too far to reach today. I stopped within sight of it. There is an enormous rock field between it and me. I think I have found the path across, but I really don't know. I climbed and climbed and climbed all day, and then finally to see it. More rocks and climbing. Tomorrow I feel it will take me two hours to walk back to where I stopped, if not more, and I'll arrive exhausted to begin my day. Will I reach Dromala tomorrow? How wide is the pass? Will I make it across and be able to begin my descent? It all seems so impossibly out of my reach. So you can see the prayer flags are getting a little bigger here. So and this is the rock field. And I'm coming up. This is a person, I believe, there. And I'm just prostrating across boulders because there's no other place to prostrate. This is the only day that my guide stayed with me the whole day. It was very dangerous. You could injure yourself very easily. Plus, it kept getting lost. Every time I was about to take a long turn, Rick Jean would show up and point, and I would just reorient my prostrations to where he was pointing. But it's just straight boulders. <coughs> and here's the, the pass, and getting closer and closer. And finally getting to the top of the pass, prostrating across the pass. This is a Milarepa's rock, which he, as part of a magical feat, when he's, there's a battle between the Bonpos and him and the Buddhists for who would be the religion of Tibet. <coughs> And by moving this rock to the top of this mountain, Milarepa won the, won the magical contest. I brought, of course, a lot of prayer flags to hang for my loved ones. So we drank Cokes and sprayed Cokes and sat and talked and hung prayer flags. And my guides were, were very sweet. They didn't encourage me and they didn't discourage me, which I appreciated. Because you can't do this from any, with anybody else's enthusiasm. You either do it because you want to or you don't. So someone cheering you on is just a distraction. My guides didn't do that. But you'll notice here, my, my apron is soaking wet because I've been prostrating in the mud and the snow and the rain. And it weighs four pounds dry. I swear it must weigh 17 pounds wet. When Rick Jin started teasing me that I was doing weight training by wearing my apron, I knew that it must be something to add that much extra weight to my body. This is coming down the other side of Dromala. So here I am. You notice that here's the Kora path coming down. And I'm prostrating diagonally up into it. Because if I prostrated heading down, I would never be able to lift my body. It was way too steep. These are the mm -hmm. sacred lakes of Shiva and Parvati. The blue is a haunting, gorgeous color. And this is a woman who was prostrating faster than me. Mm -hmm. They're just both prostrating down. Uh, prostrating down and going along. It's incredibly steep. And we just kept coming down and down and down back to the river. And prostrating the Cora path, ran right alongside white water, just on the path, prostrating. Coming out into the valley now. This I thought was a particularly beautiful money stone carved with sacred syllables. This is um, a ravine, I mean, the Cora path is here. It kind of runs, you know, with, with drop-offs, the drop-off kind of runs around here, like fingers. And I actually ran into a small caravan of yaks about here, and they were afraid to pass me. I was afraid they'd push me over the edge when they passed, but we managed to pass safely. At times I was prostrating along the edge of the river, 
and you had to hang onto rocks as you went around them. The rivers were beautiful. It's one of the reasons the Chinese want Tibet, because they're out of the water. <laughs> then again, the, the waterfalls. This particular stretch was a stretch I spent many, many hours alone that day. It was wonderful. And then I sat down by this waterfall and ate my peanut butter sandwich for lunch and drank my juice. And then I got up and continued prostrating. And a little ways ahead, there was a party of you know, 10, 12 people, maybe 30, 40 yards away from me. And this woman ran across, which was amazing to me because I couldn't possibly walk across that much distance. And she ran and apologized. She was French, but had some English. And she apologized for interrupting me, but had to give me some dutsi. And dutsi is a very sacred Buddhist substance with great spiritual vibrations in it. It's very powerful. And she just had to let me know that the Dalai Lama had given her Rinpoche this Dutsi, and she was giving it to me. So it was almost directly from the Dalai Lama. It just seemed very important to her. And she was crying and thanking me for what I was doing. And I'm thinking, if you like this so much, do it. You know, I, I didn't understand why people kept thanking me for doing this. It took me a long time to realize that they were walking core. They were making an offering in the form that was their gift. And this was the form that was my gift. So she left me with the duty in my hand and ran back to her, her uh, group. Um, I, I was just so touched by her warmth and kindness. More waterfalls. And here, we're just, okay, so we're coming down the east side of Kailash. I've gone through Dromala Pass. The next landmark is going to be Zutrupot Gampa, Zutrupot Monastery. And there it is showing up on the horizon. And as I was approaching it, this very young shepherdess, um, I was on the edge of her pasture lands, and, and she was walking very slowly with her sheep as I was prostrating. She was tracking me. And right before I got out of her pasture lands, she very shy, I'm, I'm very shy, and she came over to so these two shy people there, and she gave me two pieces of bubble gum. <laughs> it was, you know, I mean, hard candies, candy, gum is very precious in that part. I don't know what it means, but it's very precious to people. So here, this poor young shepherdess, who was just walking with me as I prostrated, and before I left, gave me this gift, which would earn her merit, you know. But it was, it was just the sweetest, sweetest moment. This is a, a rock at the entrance to Zutra Pope Bamba Grounds. This is stinging nettle, which is all around the um, horror trail, and I'm sure you know it's stinging nettle. You should, you should not touch it. Um, I took a picture of this because if you've ever seen tankas or religious paintings of Milarepa, he's usually pictured green. And the reason he's painted green is that he made a vow that he would not leave his meditation cave until he achieved enlightenment, so enlightenment in one lifetime. So he went up to his meditation cave, and practiced and practiced and practiced. And he ran out of food. He was starving. He was just about to get his alms bowl and go into town to beg for food. And he said, no, I vowed I would not leave this cave until I achieved enlightenment. So he began living off nettles. Ooh. And he ate so many nettles that his skin turned light green. <laughs> but he kept his vow, and he achieved enlightenment in a single lifetime, which I can't even get my mind around now. My cook made me nettle soup. Yeah. It was, it was yeah, very, very it's good. very thick and green, but if you don't look at it, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> this is a monastery, various outbuildings, uh, more outbuildings, more bridges. Um, again, just trying to get the perspective of how here's the core path going down across the river and then up. My guide was trying to explain to me one day that I would come to either a ridge or a bridge. I asked him to say it four times, but I couldn't figure out if I was coming to a ridge or a bridge. Turns out it was a bridge. This is one of our campsites. Um, there's my little tent and your tent. And we're in the valley now that's opening up towards Darchin. I thought, wow, we'll be at Darchin any time now. <laughs> I never got the scale of Tibet down. This is a, a, my camera couldn't really capture this. There are three storms parallel to each other coming up the valley at us. It's a magnificent storm. Um, this isn't focused, but just to give you perspective, there I am, prostrating. Just prostrating. These are all broken money stones that have been collected and 
preserved um, bare stones. And I, I thought, since we were in a valley, we would not be climbing. And the minute I thought that, the, the path again began climbing, climbing, climbing. Mm -hmm. You can see the prayer flags across the river, just looking down into the river. And this is, let's see. No, I didn't skip it. OK. So just climbing. This is one of my favorite shots. I love the colors in the mountainside. The colors, when I walked in the morning and walked home in the evening, were the same. And you would have think they would have changed or dimmed. But there's, the air is so thin, the light doesn't refract. So the colors stay vibrant and uh, the same. And this is the core path cut into the mountainside. Actually, I had to pee somewhere along here. <laughs> and you just kind of like come down a few feet off, hang on to whatever you can hang on to, but it's really very steep. Um, and manage that, which is, you know, a lot of clothes to change when you're trying to do that one-handed. Um, <laughs> but it's all part of the experience. That, ca that, that path swings around and ends up here. And this is Lake Rakshas Tal. So I knew I was getting close to Darchin, because that's the Lake of Power where the shamans turn. Here are, again, more pilgrims. I was just prostrating along, and a young man with a, a leather cowboy hat in a group of Tibetans who were walking Korra, he turned and walked back to me, and I was on the ground with my hands on. I thought you'd put your hands together for prostration. And he took my hands and he separated them and put them down on the ground and made it very clear I was not to put my hands together. And I thanked him, and he went back to his party. <laughs> so I received instruction many, many times, many, many ways. <laughs> so we're approaching Darjan now. This is the Korra path coming out of the hills. There's a washout here, you prostrate through. Very, some prayer flags, very rugged, finally coming down to flatter ground. And here we're back in Darjan. I didn't um, take pictures in Darjan. It was very curious after, you know, 20 some odd days in the wilderness prostrating in the wilderness to be suddenly prostrating on streets. Mm -hmm. I prostrated through a work line with women and men with pickaxes <coughs> and shovels who were you know, building guest houses for the Chinese. Um, I, I prostrated past cement mixers and trucks and cars and people walking and doing their business because Darchin is a town. Um, I want to read a passage here just to give you a flavor of what Darchin felt like. If I knew more about movies, I could tell you which director would have directed this surreal scene. <clears throat> it was a very busy street with an impossible congestion of incongruous elements. Businesses being built, built, residential houses, a tea shop, what looked like a Chinese officer's club, a building where there seemed to be enlisted soldiers, too. There were construction trucks, small engines, equipment and materials being offloaded, and all kinds of people. I continued my steady, slow pace prostrating up this steep, crowded street. An official-looking Chinese man in a uniform kept watching me, an officer, I think. I acknowledged him with a slight bow once and kept going. He kept watching me. I did not make eye contact because I did not want questions. I kept going. He looked like he had considerable rank and I was not comfortable with his gaze. Other people, Tibetans, looked delighted with me, gave me incredible smiles and thumbs-up encouragement. Others just looked at me with neutral expressions. Halfway up the street, one woman with wonder and joy in her eyes insisted on giving me a can of vitamin juice. She wanted to open it for me right then and there, but I needed to keep going to find out if I was even on the right street and to get away from the officer and his men. So I struggled to get the can of juice into my pocket. I kept going. The closer I got to the top, the stranger people were. Some smiles, but mostly incredulous or neutral looks. There was a monk many people of all ages, motorcycles, a pool table, and people just looking at me with masked faces. It was so surreal. I expected the Chinese to come and arrest me at any time. I felt my mere prostrating presence was an act of political rebellion, and they would seize me for it. I got to the top. That was the only time I was really worried that uh, I would get arrested or disappeared or something like that. But I made it through Darjin, and um, Actually, the police officer there, 
through great intrigue, wanted to give me a gift, but he couldn't be seen talking to me because he was part of the government. Um, but he managed to smuggle a picture of Kailash and Manasarovar to me at risk to himself. When I was prostrating out of town, you know, um, I mean, there's just people everywhere. This, I was just coming up from a prostration, and this policeman just stepped by, and I knew, I knew it was me. We just, our eyes just met, and we didn't acknowledge each other any more than that, and I continued my prostrations. But, I mean, he would have been, in, you know, at least fired, if not imprisoned, for, for contacting me. So this is leaving Darchin. We're, we're getting close here. These are all the guest houses that the Chinese build. This is the road where you can drive to Tarbashe, the two kilometers, and this is the Korra path where you cross the which is where I'm at. These are prayer wheels, which you can spin as you leave Darchin, and uh, this is just the landscape. I saw these prayer flags, and I got excited. This is the last section I wanted to read to you. The crest opened onto a view of prayer flags. I wondered if this could be Tarbashe, but it turned out to be a cemetery above Tarbashe, although I did not know there was another cemetery on the path. When I reached the crest, all I realized was that the prayer flags marked not Tarbashe, but a cemetery, which was a mountain. I was not yet at Tarbashe, where I began, or in sight of it. So I proceeded up the mountain, through the cemetery, and then began down the mountain. I kept going, maybe five plus hours into my prostration. I rounded a corner prostrating down the narrow, rocky mountainside, and there was Tarbashe. The boulder around which I came was like hundreds of boulders I had encountered on my mountainous journey. But this boulder changed everything. It gave me no warning that it was not like all the others. It was as if I descended into a prostration in a world of endless samsara, endless sameness, and I arose in a world of bliss, of possibility. As I came around that boulder, I could see the flagpole and the stupa of Tarbashe in the distance. I burst into tears. It was like the Dakinis, Tibetan spiritual beings, were saying, yes, this is possible. At that moment, for the first time since I began Korra, I felt that completion was possible, that I would perhaps be allowed to close the circle. I kept going. Two old men came by, walking Korra. They just had to touch my hands. They were so supportive of the prostrations. little closer, coming down the mountain, you can see there's the stupa and the flagpole. And I was just mm -hmm. prostrating on the home stretch now. Uh, my guide, Dorje, actually came and just sat in the Land Cruiser waiting. He was surprised I'd gotten this far. But he came and he brought lunch, uh, which I was, I was not hungry. I didn't. I would have just died not eating and not noticed it. I, I, was, I was into prostration, this is all I wanted to do. But Dorje brought lunch, which I didn't eat, uh, just crackers and Coke, because Coke was settled in my stomach. But he came because he said, um, he wanted to know if I wanted a raincoat. And I, I started to laugh. <laughs> and I said, I just done 20 days in the rain. I was, no problem, you know. Didn't need a raincoat, and he started to laugh, too. And this is approaching uh, Tarbashe the muddy land. Um, and Dorje knew the rituals of Korra, where you start doing three prostrations to the um, east, south, west, north, and keep going. And when you come back, you do three prostrations to each direction. Um, and then you're done. When I was prostrating to the fireplace, I saw Dorje and Jigne they were drawing this circle in the dirt, so I assumed I assumed I should just go there. And it's called the Lama's Prayer Circle, where I never wanted to leave. I brought katas for Dorje and Jigne to thank them, and uh, Jigne gave me a kata, which was very, very touching. And of course, we hung prayer flags. And I wanted to go and see Chupu Gampa, which is the first monastery along the way. Kailash is in the background. And it's about, a, I'd say, about a 1,500-foot climb straight up to see the Gampa. But there were some Rongjung images. Rongjung are self-manifesting. They're not carved by human hands. And Amitabha is one of the deities I'm particularly close to. And there was a Rongjung Amitabha at the Gampa. And um, 
as well as some other relics there, which we were allowed to see, which is which is a great good fortune. You know, not everyone's allowed to see them. Um, Georgia and I talked walking back down, and I was talking to him about writing this book because I didn't want to offend the Tibetans. You know, you know, who am I to write about this very private and personal and sacred journey? But he said, you know, you must write about this. People need to know this is possible. And he said something that I really appreciated. He said, look, this is hard. I'll tell you, it's, it's unspeakably hard. And he says, he says, it's hard even for Tibetans. The people don't do this. It's too hard. And you, Tracy, could not have done this without the Dakinis, which is absolutely true. And without the spiritual support of the beings around, there's no possible way I could have done this. He says, you need to write about this. And then he turned and he says, look, and by the time I got my camera out of my pocket, um, there were about 10 eagles circling us mm -hmm. as we walked down. Mm -hmm. There's still six here in this picture. Mm -hmm. But I just took that as a sign. Mm -hmm. We were driving out of Kailash back toward um, central <laughs> Tibet to see um, some of the cities there. And I was just sitting in my tent the first night, relaxing. And there's a scratching on the tent. I zip, and there's Nima. My cook, he says, how do you spell prostrations? He was working on that. <laughs> so I spell prostrations for him. Zip. <coughs> He's back. Zip. He says, how do you spell prostrations? So I found a piece of paper. I wrote down prostrations, because it's kind of a hard word. Zip. Scratch, scratch, scratch. He's back. I unzip. And there's my crew. Rich and it had to leave. He had baked a cake which said, Happy Holy Mount Kailash 2006. <laughs> in red frosting. <laughs> to celebrate the Korah. Uh, so I, I went to their tent, which was lively, and we all ate lots of cake. <laughs> Very sweet. Um, there were some prostrations I was told, like there were certain uh, parts of descending from Dromala, I was told to walk and not prostrate, to finish the prostrations at the bottom or elsewhere on the core trail. Dorje knew uh, the monks in the country since he, he'd been a monk, so he also knew the monks at Samye and Chinku. Samye is the first monastery in Tibet, and it was built by Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, uh, Trisan Detsan, the king of Tibet, the first king, and Shantavakshita, who was one of the Indian scholars. So we went to Samye to see it, went to Chimpu, and Dorje said I could finish the prostrations that I needed to finish in one of Guru Rinpoche's meditation caves. So Padmasambhava, the saint who tamed all the forces in Tibet, practice at Chimpu in this meditation cave, and I would be allowed to go there and finish prostrations. This is a statue of Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche. This is Samye, and the Chinese, again, are trying to rebuild it and make it look fancy. My guides told me that when they rebuilt this, they left, and the next morning it was destroyed. <laughs> they came back, and they rebuilt it, and left, and the next morning it was destroyed. And not by Tibetans. Um, by the spiritual forces in the land. Um, this is part of the original Samye uh, monastery. And I, I found this likeness of Guru Rinpoche beautiful. His fierceness is what he's known for, but the sweetness in his uh, face. <coughs> this is Chimpu. Chimpu is the mountainside behind Samye. And we're driving up this, I'm not good with this pointer this impassable road, and all I'm thinking is, oh my gosh, do I have to climb that? Because I didn't think I could. <laughs> We're getting closer, and you can start to see some of the prayer flags on the mountainside. Um, and happily, we didn't have to climb it. We parked up top and had to walk down, and here's my cruise tent, and they're putting up my tent there. And there's a small monastery or gampa, and there's supposed to be 108 meditation caves in the hillside, because there are 108 beads on the Tibetan model. Um, this is a, a lovely little pond that was just below my tent, where I sat and lived in the sun. Dorje really likes Chimpu, and thought we should, should uh, spend three days there before I was to leave the country, just resting and finishing prostrations. Here's some of the hillside, where you can see the various meditation caves tucked into the hillside. Um, this is Guru Rinpoche's cave, one of them, and you have to, I really wanted to see a Rangjung image of him in there, but you had to jump, you couldn't go around, and there, you know, you, you jumped from one bald boulder to another bald boulder, and that's it, there's no, nothing to hold on to, you either made it or you didn't. 
but I really wanted to see that, so I did. This is a close-up of that um, of the meditation chamber, how it's marked in the preceding slide. And inside there is this round jump image, which my friend Marcus took a picture of. So this is self-manifesting. This is not carved. This manifested out of the rock. The Tibetans have katas and flowers around it to honor it. But that's inside this, this rock cave. It's a beautiful, beautiful image of Padmasambhava. And this is a stupa and around the monastery on the way up. Remember, Tibet is always up. And this is the meditation cave where I did the final prostrations. Uh, it's a house that's been built over one of Guru Rinpoche's meditation caves. Um, so I went in there and spent a day. I spent five hours prostrating. The cave itself, I, if I had gone in the cave itself, I barely fit from head to foot because I'm tall. Um, so I, I prostrated just outside the cave, at the mouth of the cave, because there were other pilgrims visiting the shrine, and I didn't feel it was fair for me to take up the entire cave. At the end of the day, when no one else was around, before I left to, to walk back down the mountain, I went in Guru Pache's cave and did the last seven prostrations there, and I thought my body would shake apart. And the power in that land was stunning. I could not possibly have prostrated a whole day in there and survived it. I was not ready to do that. But I was very blessed to experience that the last seven prostrations. So, this is beautiful Kailash. Um, I'll try not to cry when I talk about this, but we will we'll, we have odds on this. Um, before I left, my teacher and classmates had a gathering to support me. And um, one of the things they did was to give me a card. And in the card, they each wrote a blessing or an encouragement for me on my journey. What Marcus wrote, my teacher wrote, he said, the center of the spiritual universe already exists in your human heart. Meet your mirror. So he was saying that I wasn't going to Kailash to find something new or something I didn't already have. That Kailash is what I look like on the inside which is the meet your mirror part. It's what you look like on the inside. And not in your spiritual heart, in your human heart. Not in your energy body, but in the flesh. In all of the crappy, messy, contradictory, partially evolved stuff that makes us human. That's what Kailash looks like in your human heart. When I was leaving Tibet, which was, I mean, it felt like somebody stuck their hand in my chest and ripped my heart out. Because I never, never wanted to leave. But I had to leave because visas run out. So Dorje, who was very, very good, very, very direct, Dorje, was, we were saying goodbye because it's the third world country, so we walked over the border. You know, it's not, you know, here's Tibet, here's Nepal. You walk over the border carrying your stuff. Before I walked over the border, he said, seven weeks is not enough for me. And I said, not enough for me either, don't you? And then he said, one heart. We are one heart. Mm -hmm. You can't be separated. You're one heart. So, thank you. Wow. I don't know if you have any questions. If you do, I'd be happy to do my best. Mm -hmm. Mia? When you said you had the calling, could you explain that? I always feel odd talking about it, but I wrote about it in the book. Um, I was on vacation with friends in North Carolina. They had a timeshare and asked me if I wanted to come along. Who wouldn't want to go along? Um, and I was just, since I had no schedule, you know, usually there's so much to do in any day. You fit prayer in where you can, and sometimes you can't fit it in. But I was on vacation. I had my own little suite of rooms, bathroom, bedroom, it was lovely. And I was just doing practice, just uh, some Tibetan Buddhist prayers that I like. No big deal. And, and I wasn't like 
fervent or passionate. I was just praying. And three Dakinis, who are, Dakinis are Tibetan spiritual beings, three Dakinis showed up, like if I'm here in the room, they were right there. And I couldn't see them, but I could feel them. And they said very clearly to me, um, it's time for you to return to Tibet sometime within the next two years. And when you're there, do prostrations around Mount Kailash. And then they left. So that's, because I mean, I didn't know people did prostrations around Mount Kailash. I didn't know Cora. I mean, I didn't know what that was. Um, I loved Tibet for no reason, because like, I, I just have always had a feeling for Tibet. But so you had been there before? No. No. I'm sure past I've lives have been <laughs> many times, but not in this lifetime. But that's how the calling came, just showed up. And I, and I thought about it. I actually called up Marcus, my, my friend. I said, Marcus, I'm going to Tibet. He said, cool. I said, I'm going to do prostration on Mount Kailash. He said, you'd want to do that. <laughs> and I thought, I must have just said something really stupid. So I just talked about other things. And then about uh, <coughs> three or four months later, I went down to attend one of his workshops. And I was just hanging out with him at his house. And I said, Marcus, I want to do prostration on Mount Kailash. And he said, uh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> and I said, about you know, 90 seconds later, I said, Marcus, I'm going to do prostrations around Mount Kailash. And he said, um, why? And I said, because I want to. And he leaped up gave me a big hug and said, do you know how to do prostrations? I said, no. He showed me how to do prostrations. <laughs> but that was one of those pilgrimages that, you know, from the calling I received to the decision to commit, <coughs> no matter who thought what about it, it, it wasn't anybody else's choice. And it wasn't founded in logic or knowledge. It was founded in my heart. And so it took me time to commit. But once I committed, it was like, it was like ice cold water ran through my body. It was like, I was terrified. I was clear. I was also very calm. So that's how I came to, to go. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about how your life is different now than it was before. <clears throat> it's always hard to answer that question. Um, You know, I've become more honest. I really wanted to hate the Chinese. Mm -hmm. But love is not divisible. You either love everything or you don't. So living with that is a practice. Mm -hmm. I've certainly become humbler. Um, you know, from going back to Darchin and seeing the bathrooms and saying, "Wow, bathrooms!" <laughs> as opposed to saying, "Ew," you know. And, um, and 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 having to talk. I mean, talking in public is like not something I do very often, if I can possibly avoid it. <laughs> um, but. I, it also becomes clearer and clearer to me that what we have to share with each other is our experience. And that being human is one of the harder things to do on the planet. And we have to show each other how we each do it. Because it helps. It helps me to see how you do humanness and to share with you how I do humanness. Because there's no right way to do it. But we're, we're one heart. We're not separate. <coughs> Being at Kailash changed my body. I mean, I lost at least 30 pounds when I was there. I mean, when we finally got to Central Lhasa, there was a hotel which had a mirror. I hadn't had a mirror for a month, which was fine. Who needs a mirror in the <laughs> You know. But I took my clothes off to take a bath, and I looked in the mirror, and I looked like a concentration camp survivor. I, was, I, was, I lost muscle mass. It took years for my hair to grow back in, because I had the nutrition. You, you use everything in your body just to keep prostrating. Mm -hmm. But my, my issues tend to be in my body anyway. So that I was called to do prostrations was a blessing because it meant I had to pray with my body. I'm good at praying with my spirit. That's easy. 
but praying with my flesh is much harder. But that was the beginning of a lifetime of continuing to figure out how to be in this body. Um, Kailash holds the wisdom of body, the body, speech, and mind, and the system, and Kailash holds the wisdom of body. So it's just wonderful that I was called to go there. I don't know, that's some changes. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's Have you done prostrations in other places, or do you feel called to do more, or do you? No. No, no particular transmissions to go anywhere or do anything. I continue to do prostrations as I can, just to, to keep the connection to the Dakini and to the core. Um, but. No, I've never received a calling like that before. I don't know if I ever will again, um, but not yet anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just hearing about it, it moves me, you know, just to make that connection with the earth and to do that, like there's sacred places here and maybe not quite to that level. But. No, it's to, this, it's to the same level. Yeah. I mean, um, Professor Toomey at Landmark, who teaches a course in pilgrimage, um, invites me to talk to his students, which has been a great joy. And apparently one of his students prostrated from Dummerston to Brattleboro. <laughs> he was so inspired. And he was like, Bless your heart. And that's just as deep as, as Kailash, because it comes from a pure intention. So thank you. I just have a question, Tracy. I, I read the book in this long time ago, so I, I don't really remember, but I do remember when I first thought about you doing this, it was like, okay, you just keep doing it. But you had to hike in many hours and out many hours a day. Is that accurate? Yes. To the Quora? Well, so, so if, I don't know how to do this. If, if, they pitch tent there uh -huh. and say, I'm, I stopped prostrations there. I would prostrate maybe this far, then put another cairn down, and then walk to my tent. And I, so I, so the next morning I would walk back to here and start from there. Like so, so where the tent was, I'd walk, you know, I'd prostrate ahead of it, and then walk back to sleep, and prostrate back to my starting point, prostrate further, walk back, walk ahead to where I stopped, walk back, until they put camp in front of me. Mm -hmm. But how, how long would that take you? It varied. If I was close to camp, it would take me 15 minutes. Uh -huh. At Dromola, it took, it took me two hours. Mm -hmm. And I had to climb that thousand foot hill twice, once prostrating, which was easy, relatively speaking. But I had to walk up the, to get back to my starting place the next day. It took me two hours. So you're exhausted by the time you get there. Yeah. But you're exhausted all the time. You know, I mean, one, one of the really beautiful experiences of this, of this Cora is that if I had not kept a journal, if I had not written my experiences down every day, and you had said to me, were you ever sick or cold? I would have said no. I would have said no. I didn't remember it. You know, now I'm, re I'm reading the journal going, I was sick all the time. And I was freezing all the time. Right? But, but I was where I wanted to be. So it was joyful. It wasn't like, oh, I'm enduring the cold. No, I was cold. I was having the experience of cold. I was having the experience of nausea. I was having the experience of headache. But I was where I wanted to be. So it was joy. It was joy. So I was tired. I was exhausted all the time. I mean, I mean, I, I have to read your sections, but there are places on day 27 I'm talking about, this is too hard. The formlessness is too hard. The lack of knowing anything about where I am is too hard. Because the moment comes and the moment's gone. They can't, they can't even hold on to the moment because the moment keeps changing. It's gone. It's too hard. Right? So it was always too hard. But I was never unhappy to be there. And I never prostrated if I was done. I was done for the day. I never pushed. Um, and I just, I was just in, in joy. I mean, there's a place which is beyond suffering. And I mean, I, I was in dire straits, but I was not suffering. I mean, there was one night I thought I was not going to make it back to camp. And I was, I was like walking like that, because I had no strength. I was really, so I was really sick. Um, and it, I thought I'll never make it back to camp. I just kept walking like that. <laughs> People would look at me, 
So I'm sure I looked very strange, so I was about to fall over because I felt that way. You know. But I was not suffering. I was happy. So yeah, there was walking back and forth to my starting point took a lot of energy. You just begin with what you have. Does that answer your question? It's just daunting to me. Yes. I would never do this by choice. If I wasn't, you know, if you said, do you want to go do this again, why would I do this again? <laughs> if I was called, I would do it immediately. But I, I don't have the capacity to do this. That's I have I, to say, when I read the book, it's probably a one sitting. I was exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that. Then it was just totally. Did you lose 30 pounds? <laughs> 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 Maybe you should try again. <laughs> yeah. But that's how well written I think it was. Thanks. Tracy, would you tell us uh, after you moved through your nausea with your hard boiled eggs? And oh. Such, what did your cook prepare for you? You know, the silly going? thing is, Nimala, sweet, sweet young man that he is, he made me pizza. <laughs> <laughs> he made me dal and rice, a lot of Indian food, curry, dals, things like that. Um, and I was as vegetarian as I could be. I was vegetarian. Um, I mean, I was—I didn't care. I was—I mean, had to make myself eat. I'd have porridge for breakfast. I hate porridge, but you needed the calories. So I'd make myself eat it occasionally. You'd make me a fried egg, things like that. But for dinner, it was you know rice soup, Indian dolls. We had pizza one night. Um, that's what I remember. I wish he'd given me tzampa, you know, the barley flour with salt tea. But I got black tea with milk, which, you know, I'm not a tea drinker, but boy, you just you get very attached to your black tea with milk. Mm -hmm. When I got back, um, I couldn't stop crying because I didn't want to be here. Mm -hmm. I finally just constructed something that I put over me so I could get through my day. And then I'd come home. I mean, if there were microphones in my house, this, I and mean, I was wailing and howling. I just, I, my heart was so broken with grief that I couldn't be in Kailash and be in Tibet. It took me probably two years to even stop to stop that. Um, but it's still there. It still hurts all the time not to be in Tibet. Um, I look for opportunities to go back. So I don't think I ever really adjusted to coming back. I mean, what I wrestle with is all places are the same. I mean, Kailash, I had this experience the other day where I felt Kailash inside me. I mean, it's, it's the blessings streaming out of that mouth and are streaming out of my heart. And I need to keep finding that experientially here because there's no better place to be. Pilgrimage is about dying. You, know, you die to who you are, and then you awaken and you don't know who you are. And you find out that, and you die again, moment by moment. And that's the way you live. Would it be different if you went back? I mean, would you? Would that feeling be relieved? I have no idea. And I went back and saw Eastern Tibet the following year. And I didn't know. I didn't know if I had to go back to kind of finish the closure in my heart, or something about closing the circles. The Dakini just kept saying, close the circle. I understood better when I went back to that time. That was Eastern Tibet, which is very different from Western Tibet. Um, but I'm curious, and I expect I'll go back to Kailash at some point before I die. And I wonder what it will be like. Even going back to Fasa, I wonder what it will be like. I don't know. Feels like home, but I could be wrong. Might be going to go back to Can never be ordinary. I don't know. We'll see. Look at it. Not ever. Mm -hmm. You do have a point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for spending your evening. Thank you. So thank kind you. Thank you.